I'm going to preach a message just for a few moments. I want to be out here early today entitled, Loose Thy Shoe. And I want you to look at three people and tell them those words. Tell them, Loose Thy Shoe. Joshua chapter number 5 and verse number 13. The Bible says that it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him, and he said unto him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Verse 14 says that he said, Neither, but as captain of the host of the Lord, I am now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and did worship, and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Again, we're going to preach a message just for a few moments entitled, Loose Thy Shoe. Let's all say that again. Loose thy shoe. Join hands with a person standing next to you and let us pray Lord we thank you for this day that you have made God I thank you for the preordination and the predestination that this day carries with it God you have preordained and predestined this day you have ordered our steps to be right here right now where we're at and as we join hands together we also join our spirits our souls and our hearts together in agreement in this place now I thank you that you are here I thank you that your presence is here. God, we ask you to have your way today. We certainly ask you to speak because we are listening. God, I ask you to speak through me in the name of Jesus. And everyone said amen. Let's lift up one more great big praise. Amen. Thank you, guys. I'm good. Let's put our hands together and give Jesus Christ a big praise. Can you just ask him to speak all day, God? We want you to speak to us. In Jesus' name, y'all can sit down. Loose thy shoe. Let me start off by saying that days of storms test who we truly are during days of sun. Days of storms truly test who we are during days of sun. No one is exempt from the storm. Can somebody say amen? amen? I'm going to say it again. No one is exempt from the storm. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is like a wise person who builds a house on solid rock, is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter number 7. Jesus said that though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on solid rock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. They are like a person who builds his house on the sand. And when the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. No one is exempt from the storm. If there was one thing that Jesus was trying to teach us in Matthew chapter number 7, it is that we all in our own way face storms and adversities in life. There are a myriad of reasons that we face storm, that we face adversity, that we face tribulation. But if there is one thing that you can be sure of, it is that not one human being, regardless of their race, regardless of their social status, regardless of their last name, regardless of their office, regardless of their uniform, is exempt from adversity. We all face storms one way or another. I'm going to say it again. We all face storms one way or another because none of us is exempt from the storms of life. Can someone say amen? 
This I certainly want to stress to you today, and I want to remind us all of this fact that we all go through stuff in life, each one of us. But the more important fact that I want to stress today to you is that no one owns the rights to the storm. I'm going to say that again. No one owns the rights to the storm. Not one of us own the rights or have trouble and adversity copyrighted. None of us own it. Not a person, not a culture, not a social status. None of us have a monopoly on difficulties. We all face difficulties one way or another. I know that that is hard to hear. I know that is hard to accept for us sometimes. But just because you're going through a troubled season in your life does not mean that you own the rights to trouble. You do not get to dictate who determines who is going through legitimate trouble and who is not going through legitimate trouble. Too many of us want to square off and proclaim to be God and we forget that we are each individuals of his creation and God is no respecter of man, God is no respecter of office, God is no respecter of ethnicity, God does not respect any of that stuff and we all have to go through stuff in this journey that we call life. I'm ready to see a people in this hour that drop their rights to their trouble and realize we all go through trouble can someone give God a big praise and say amen in this place I don't have time for a lot of introduction we got to get out of this service I know I jumped right into the word most afflictions are not self-inflicted I'm going to say it again most inflict afflictions are not self-inflicted Let me say it one more time. Most afflictions are not self-inflicted, and that is the case for everybody. That's the case for most of us in this life. Most of what we go through, we did not bring on ourselves. This is another common denominator that all of us have. Can someone say amen? When we walk through situations in life that seem unfair, When we walk through situations in life that seem like they are more that we can bear, when we walk through situations in life that are difficult, that are adverse, that push us to our limits, us as believers seem to always ask the same question. Even atheists will ask this question in their most difficult of moments. And that question is, is God seeing what I'm seeing? I'm going to ask it again. Is God seeing what I'm seeing? If each and every one of you were honest with me today, you would admit to me that you have asked that question before multiple times in your life. Each and every one of us have found ourselves within a circumstance that we say, God, are you seeing what I am going through right now? Or God, are you seeing what we as a people are going through right now? People forever have been asking this question. David asked this question in the 10th Psalm in verse number 1. David asked the question, why, Lord, do you stand afar off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Is there anybody in here this morning that has ever asked that question before? You feel like you're going through something that God is not even paying attention to? Have you ever felt like you were going through a season in your life where God had turned his eyes away from you and God is not watching? We have all asked that question. We want to know where God is And we want to know where God stands in the midst of trouble. We want to know where he is. And God, where do you stand when we go through trouble? Joshua asked the question in Joshua chapter number 5, Are you for us or are you for our adversaries? It is a little legitimate question to want to know who the creator of all things is choosing to side with. This is a legitimate question. It is the bigger question. Not God, do you see what I'm going through? But the bigger question is God, whose side? 
side are you on in this situation? Because as the old saying goes, there are two sides to every story. There are multiple sides to my affliction. If I'm going through affliction, then usually that means there is an afflict or. If I am going through resistance, usually that means there is something that is resisting me. And so we are always inclined to ask the question, God, are you on my side or are you on the side of my affliction? God, or are you on my side or are you on the side of my pain? pain. God, whose side are you on? Is there anybody in this place today wondering, God, whose side are you on? This question lies within each and every one of our hearts. The question exposes the heart of the first. This question exposes the heart of the first question. Because when I got to questioning God myself, and I got to thinking about everything that I'm preaching to you right now. I realized something. I realized that really we don't want to know if God is seeing what we're seeing, Brother Rick. And really, we, we don't want to know whose side God is on. We don't want to know if God sees, and we don't want to know, God, whose side are you on? Here's the real question or the real statement that we're making. We are really wanting to know if God sees how we see. You see, it's different. Uh, uh, it, it's something to see what I see, Pastor Norris, but it's an entirely different thing for me to see the same thing as you, but we have different perspectives of what we are seeing. And so our complaint to God isn't, God, do you see what I'm seeing? Because we as believers are fully aware that God can see everything at all times. We understand this as believers, but our frustration comes from this point of wondering, God, do you see how I see? In other words, are you as frustrated with what I'm going through as I am with what I'm going through? Is there anybody up in place for life today? Are you as frustrated with what I'm going through as I am with what I'm going through? And more importantly, God, do you see the cause of my frustration the same way that I see the cause of my frustration? Can somebody say amen? We know that if God be for us, then nothing can be against us. We understand that. But many of us just misunderstand why that if becomes an is. I'm going to say it again. Many of us misunderstand why the if God becomes a God is. How many of you know that God is on your side, but there's a reason for it? Let me help all of us with something today. God is not for us based on what we want him to be for us for. God isn't based God isn't for us based on what many times we want him to be. God is not for us based on our position. God is not for us based on our ethnicity. God is not for us based on our office. God is not for us based on the circumstances that created the life that we have. God is not for us based on our last name. God is for us based on where we have placed him within our hearts. I'm going to say it again. God is for us based on where we have placed our hearts in relation to him. God is not movable. God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. God does not change. God does not jump the fence back and forth every time things in life seem unfair. God is not worried about picking sides with you, and God is not worried about picking sides with your enemy. Because really up to this point, no question that I've asked today really matters. None of these questions matter. God, do you see what I see? God, do you see how I see? None of this stuff really matters. The question that matters today is the one that God is asking, not the one that we are asking. And God today is asking, are you on my side? That's what he wants to know. 
As a matter of fact, it is not God who should ever be called into question. Who are we to question God in times of adversity? We can learn something like people from Job when he said God has a right to give and God has a right to take away. It is amazing to me the attention that we give to God when we feel like he is uninvolved in our life. Yet the lack of attention we give to him when he is completely involved in our life. We live a blessed life. We live favored lives and we stop going to church, we stop seeking his name, we stop serving him, but as soon as trouble hits, we look at God and try to place the blame on him like God, how could you allow this to happen to me? And God is asking a question today who are you to call me in the question? I want to know whose side that you are on. Look at somebody and ask them, are you on God's side? Ask them again, are you on God's side? Give me five minutes and I'll be finished. Ask somebody again, are you on God's? As a matter of fact, ask yourself, am I on God's side? Am I on God's side? God, forgive us for questioning you. God, forgive us for calling you into question. God, forgive us for trying to place the blame of our culture on you and the tribulation of society on you. It is not your fault when we go through hard times, God. Are you on God's side? See, we can fool other people and make them think that we're on God's side when we go to church enough. We can fool other people and make them think that we're on God's side when we can quote enough scripture and say glory to God and quicken and say the right thing when we're around people that really don't know us. We can act like we're on God's side when we, when we fake pray, and some of y'all know what I'm talking about in front of people, can't straighten things out internally, yet think that our prayers are re reaching heaven. We can fool other people with that, but we can't fool God. You see, the only way to tell that a people or a person is truly on God's side is from the heart. Only the heart can answer this question. Our prayer life really in front of other people can't answer this question. Our church attendance can't answer this question. Only a person's heart can truly answer this question. The heart shows who we really are. Seasons like the one that we are going through right now reveal the heart of every man. Tragedy, strife, and tension, and things like that have a way of exposing the heart of mankind. I'm going to say it again. Tragedy and strife have a way of exposing the heart of mankind. Jeremiah chapter number 17 and verse number 10. The Lord says, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways. Not to give every man according to his position. Not to give every man according to his office. Not to give every man according to his ethnicity, Pastor Norris. But God deals with, with us according to our heart and nothing else. Nothing more and nothing less. Can someone say amen? In 1 Samuel chapter number 16, the Lord spoke to the prophet Samuel. And he said, the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. What have we become as believers and as Christians that concerning ourselves with the condition of external fairness has taken priority over concerning ourselves with the condition of our hearts? I'll ask it again. What have we become as believers and as Christians that we concern ourselves more with external conditions and priorities? 
prioritize that over concerning ourselves with the condition of our own heart. God ain't never asked us to judge another man's heart. God has never asked us to judge another man's intention. God has never asked us to judge another man's desire to do something. God has only asked us to judge ourselves. As a matter of fact, my Lord told me to search your own ways. Search your own heart. Not the heart of everybody else. While we're so busy trying to figure out everyone else's intention, God is wondering, when are you going to check yourself in this hour? You better look at yourself and put your hand on yourself and say, self, today you are checking yourself. I'm not worried about somebody else. I'm not worried about who they are. I'm not worried about what they say they represent. The only thing I am concerning myself with today is my own heart. God, is my heart right with you? God is searching our hearts today. Psalm chapter number 51 and verse number 10. David in all of his frustration always resorted back to these kinds of prayers. God create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 37 and verse number one, uh, excuse me, Psalm 37 verse number 40 says, fret not yourselves because of evildoers. Be not as envious as wrongdoers. They will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Let me say it again. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit to the Lord. Trust in him. And he will act. A heart that is after God is exposed by its trust in him. Above and transcendent over all of our preconceptions. God, I trust you no matter what I think ought to happen. God, I trust you no matter what I think is fair or unfair. God, I trust you no matter what situation you placed me in in this earth. For me to tell you that there's a problem with where you placed me, God, is for me to rebuke you and to spit in your face. God, you knew exactly what you were doing when you sent me into this earth, gave me the name that you gave me, gave me the color of skin that you gave me. God, I trust that you knew what you were doing. You sent me here with good intention. You sent me here with pure intention. Is there a people in this place that say, God, I want my heart to stay right today? If there is, why don't you take a few seconds and give God that kind of praise. A heartfelt praise. I'm almost finished. Joshua surrendered himself to the voice of the Lord. Joshua saw this angel and asked the question, whose side are you on? And the angel uh, uh, shed a light uh, to Joshua that God has been trying to tell us millennium after millennium. God is trying to tell us that I am not from here. I'm not from here. I am the captain of the host of the Lord. The NIV says the commander of the army of the Lord. I ain't for you and I'm not for them. I know who I serve. What I love about Joshua is that when Joshua heard this, Joshua, the, ba the Bible says, fell face down in front of the angel. And he asked the angel a question that we should all be asking today. Joshua asked, what message does my Lord have for his servant? You see, the people of God, when we go through tribulation, we need to learn that before we do everything, anything else, we really don't have anything to say until we are truly willing to listen to what God has to say to us. I'm going to say it again. We really don't have anything to say until we understand that we have to listen and hear what God has to say to us. In order for Joshua to be victorious, God tested his heart. 
Joshua 24 and verse 14, Joshua speaking. He says, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. He says, throw away the gods of your ancestors. Throw away the gods that they worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day by whom you will serve. Is it going to be the gods of your ancestors beyond the Euphrates or the God of the Amorites in whose land you are living? Or is it going to be like me? Because Joshua said, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. I don't identify with my ancestors. I don't identify with current culture. What I identify with is the kingdom of God. I am a member of the people of God I am a person of the people of God he is my God and I am his people I ain't worried about anything else after that and I'm gonna teach my children to live the same way as for me and my house I'm gonna serve God I'm not gonna serve anything else is there anybody in this place that says I'm not going to serve the propaganda that's being thrown at me I'm not going to serve the hate that's coming that my way I'm not going to serve serve man's opinion but I am going to serve God the king of kings and the lord of lords now then Joshua said throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the lord yield your hearts to the lord see when we are truly serving God then we can't bring everything else up in it with us. We can't bring our opinions in with us. We can't bring our victimization in with us. Oh, can somebody come up in this place today? We can't bring our opinions with us. We can't bring our titles with us. We can't bring any of that with us when we serve the Lord. We've got to set all of that stuff aside. The people said, we will serve the Lord God and obey him. Listen, when we realize that we are the people of God, then we must embrace that we belong to a kingdom that transcends and supersedes anything that is temporal and physical about us. You see, when you decide that I am going to serve God and be a part of his people, then we must finally come to a place as a people that we trade our colors in. We trade our loyalties in. My loyalty to the kingdom of God is stronger than my loyalty to my last name. My loyalty to the kingdom of God is stronger than my loyalty to my nation. It's stronger than my loyalty to my color. It's stronger than my loyalty to my degree or my fraternity or my sorority or my gang or my people or my granddaddy, uh, my ancestors, my loyalty to the kingdom is sold out. Jesus said to take up your cross and follow me. As a matter of fact, he said that anyone that is not willing to deny their mother and their father is not worthy to take up a cross and become my disciple. But if you're going to follow me, you've got to be willing in times of trouble to realize where loyalty lies within your heart. Is there a people up in this place that say, I'm not loyal to all that other stuff. I am loyal to the God that I serve and the people of God that serve him with me. I don't care what color they are. I don't care what title they are. I don't care how much money they have in the bank or how poor they are. We are a people of God. God, see your people. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. John chapter number 18. Hear me today. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, he said, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. 
in Luke chapter number 17, Jesus said, Neither shall they say, Lo, here or over there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. I'm going to say it again. You're not going to say, oh, it's over there and it's over here. Because behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So if Jesus is saying, then my kingdom is not of this world, but it's from another place. And then he's going to turn around and say, that the kingdom of God is within you, then we have to come to a place that we understand as the people of God that there is something that we carry inside of us that is greater than what we can see with our natural eye. I don't identify with what I can see. I identify with what I'm carrying internally because I'm carrying a kingdom around on the inside of me that is not loyal to anything temporal on this earth. What I'm carrying around is from another world and from another place. When we identify as the people of God, we deny ourselves. I'm closing, but the angel of the Lord told Joshua in our text, when Joshua bowed down and fell at the angel's feet, the angel of the Lord said, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon you stand is holy. And the Bible says that Joshua did so. Joshua, before he could march in victory, had to take his shoes off in the presence of God. Look at somebody and tell them, loose your shoe. Tell them again, loose your shoe. The reason why is found in this principle that Jesus taught, that when you go into a town and that town rejects you, then dust the dust off from your feet and move on to the next town. Because there are certain places that you go that you can't carry where you've been with it. You see, when you get into the presence of God, every experience, every circumstance, every single step that has made you who you are, when you get in his presence, you have got to take it off. You can't acknowledge God while acknowledging everything that you've been through in your life. You've got to choose which one is going to be God. What is going to be God to me? My experiences, what is going to be God to me? My skin color what is going to be God with to me my opinion listen to me when God is God we take all that stuff off to show him that really at the end of the day God you are priority even if your opinion is different than my opinion then guess what God's opinion wins because God always wins as there are people in this house that are ready to dismantle everything that life has tried to throw on you every Every lie that the enemy has tried to tell you that you need to carry into the presence of God. Are you telling me that God doesn't know what you go through? Are you telling me that God doesn't know what we go through as a people? Are you telling me that God can't see what this nation is going through right now? Are you telling me that God is too small to handle what we're going through? And I'm finished. Everyone can stand. God sees every tear. God sees every heartbroken. God sees every circumstance. God is aware of every opinion. God is aware of every perspective. But none of that matters when you are the people of God. The only thing that matters when we are the people of God is his perspective and our heart concerning him. The question today is, where is our heart? I encourage you and I implore you, with every hand raised and every head bowed, to keep your heart pure. Keep your heart righteous. Keep your heart where God intends us to keep our heart. In the name of Jesus, I encourage you to be the people of God. I encourage you to represent Jesus. Don't represent anything else. Don't represent a history. 
Don't represent an office. Don't represent a bias. Represent Jesus Christ in this hour that we live. Listen to what I'm telling you. The 144th Psalm says, Happy is a people whose, God, whose Lord is God. I'm going to say it again. Happy is a people whose Lord is a God. We live in an hour of unhappiness. We live in an hour of tension. We live in an hour of heartbreak. It's time for us to put down the pointing finger of blame and lift our hands up and open our hearts up to the creator of all men and say, God, have your way. Keep my heart pure. Keep our heart pure as a people, God. When a remnant of people decide to do this, they are always effective. When a remnant decides to take this posture, they are always effective. This is my encouragement to you today. This is my word to you today in the name of Jesus. Let's all give him praise in Jesus' name. Have you received anything today?